Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with the Frugal Physician, where Dr. Disha Spath will be your companion on this exciting financial adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. Pearson Ravitz's story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then, a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery. Her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Ravitz, Stephanie founded Pearson Ravitz, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Ravitz serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Ravitz, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRavitz.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Ravitz advisor. Welcome to another episode of Finding Financial Freedom with the Frugal Physician. I'm your host, Dr. Disha Spath. And today, we have a practicing emergency medicine physician who discovered the path to financial independence a bit later in life. His mission is to inspire and guide late starters on their journey towards financial freedom. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Yant, host of the Catching Up to Fi podcast. Welcome, Dr. Bill Yant. How are you? I'm doing great, Disha. Good to be here with you today. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you for being here. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey? I'm an emergency physician by trade, and my journey as a physician financially is pretty typical of a lifestyle inflated paycheck to paycheck physician. In residency, I came out of residency with $30,000 of credit card debt and student loan debt. Back then, med school was a lot cheaper, but there was still debt involved. And then we bought the big house, we bought the new car, and it went from there. We did not pay attention to our money. If we could make the payment, we could afford it, right? That was not a good way to look at it. So our lifestyle inflated over the years. We did not pay attention to the money. We didn't know what our net worth was. We didn't know what we were spending. We didn't know what we were saving, really. We were single-digit savers, is my best guess, over time. Somehow we thought the world would take care of us. We went through all this, raising kids and in the funnel of life, with our heads in the sand and our hands tied behind us, and woke up at 50 and said, what the heck happened? Wow. So first of all, it's so easy to do the big house and the new car when you're a new attending. Everyone tells you you're going to be fine. And of course, the lenders are willing to lend to you. So while it is certainly harder to make progress, you know, I wouldn't consider that a humongous mistake. Certainly living larger initially makes things much harder going forward. It's so funny that you said about we didn't know our net worth. I feel like Sometimes people think when people talk about net worth, they're kind of extraordinarily rich, right? I grew up so poor that people that even mentioned net worth were somewhat of the other to me. It seems to me that now I have become one of the net worth people and I don't consider myself ludicrously rich. It's just, I think, a matter of fact. When you look at your finances in the eye, you have to figure out your net worth. Yeah, well, a lot of physicians these days start with a negative net worth in the six-figure range. What is it, $250,000 of student loans plus whatever consumer debt and mortgage debt they have? I mean, we're behind the eight ball. And as Jim Dolly always says, you know, you got to live like a resident for five years and pay off your debt and focus on saving as well. And we did not do that. I mean, we were fortunate that we didn't have the big student loan debt. Mm -hmm. That has generated a lot of financial literacy out of physicians these days. Yes. And platforms like yours are essential to fixing this problem. Yes. So you mentioned you woke up to financial independence at 50. 
Can you tell us what triggered this realization and what it felt like to start on this journey later in life? Well, we were empty nesters and I turned 50. And all of a sudden I had this headspace and I realized we made every mistake possible. We bought whole life insurance as new attendings, made all the consumer mistakes. And at 50, I was just like, oh my gosh, my kids are out of the house. We have less than a million dollars saved and I want to retire. I'm starting to burn out. And how do I manage that? I'm stuck in the golden handcuffs. I've got to work. I can't retire. I can't retire early. I may be lucky to retire on time. And luckily, I woke up at 50, which makes it possible to retire even before time with the plan we have. Awesome. Tell us a little bit more about the plan that you have. When we woke up, we had created an investor policy statement. You have to have goals and then you have to you know, map out your goals and then do the numbers and see how fast can I get there and how painful will it be because you've got to lead a balanced life. You know, as a late starter, tighten your belt too much because you've gotten used to certain things. And what we did in our superpower as late starters was to escalate our savings rate dramatically. We went to 40 and 50% overnight, pretty much. And miraculously, our lifestyle didn't seem to change that much. We were just more conscious. How did you do that? Tell us some of the things that you cut. Well, we downsized our house. That's a big We made sure our cars were paid off. And we paid off our house and then we threw everything towards savings and we just didn't let the money slip through our fingers anymore. We weren't paying attention to it. As soon as we started paying attention to it and realized where it was going, it was easy to cut. And some of it was travel. Some of it was lifestyle expenses. And then my wife, thankfully, went back to full-time work after you know the kids were fully out of the house. So that gave us a much bigger shovel. And we moved towards saving really half we lived on one income, as people you know. Physician on Fire talks about live on one income. We basically did that. It made a huge difference. And so we're catching up rapidly. Significant numbers every year. We don't have the time for compounding, so we have to maximize the savings rate. But the path is the same for firees, you know, the young firees, as well as for late starters like us. You know, you wake up, you are excited, you go down the rabbit hole. You learn how to take control of your finances, take it away from the financial advisors that are charging you one to one and a half percent AUM, which we did too, and take control of your money. We moved to Vanguard, all low cost index funds, no more actively managed funds like we've been put in. We were sending our advisors, kids to college. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Yep. And once you do all that, cut the fees, increase your savings rate, the momentum takes over. And our path is probably about 12 years, 12 to 13 years from wake up to finish, or at least part-time work. You know, you've got to have structure to your retirement and be able to move back from full-time work and work as I want to, or if at all. And that's important for physicians because burnout is a reality. And financial literacy and taking control of your finances really is a cure for burnout in my mind. Yeah, I totally agree. I think financial wellness is a humongous part of wellness overall for physicians and having just financial stability, not even independence. You know, you don't have to have enough money in the bank to retire today. Just getting to the point where you have most of your debts paid down and you have a good amount of cushion, three to six month emergency fund, and you have your fully funding your retirement account. It just gives you so much more flexibility when it comes to designing your schedule, looking for the ideal job, taking time to look for that job, not feeling pressured like you have to go to work. Just that little extra bit of freedom makes your life so much better and really, for me, has reignited my love for medicine. Well, actually, I've cut back on work, which extends our runway a little bit. But to manage the burnout, I'm working low full time. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to burn the candle at both ends. I can manage my time a lot more. I have time for our podcast Mm -hmm. and doing other things outside of work. So, you know, working less, but saving more at the same time, you know, it's okay to take a little longer. I'm very fortunate, as I said, that my wife works full time and we're going to get there. We're going to make it absolutely possible. We want to see people wake up sooner. We want to see physicians wake up sooner. You know, the numbers are pretty catastrophic that 25% of physicians 
don't have a million dollars at age 60. It's unbelievable with our high incomes that we can get caught in that trap. Yeah, we make, even the lowest earning docs make over 10 million in their career. And the fact that we're unable to hold on to not even a million, <laughs> which sounds pretty obnoxious to say, but it is a pretty small percentage of how much we're actually earning. And a part of that, like you mentioned, is just we get sucked into this lifestyle inflation early on. Everyone kind of wants to give us and lend us money because we are good borrowers and we tend to pay debts back. And then, you know, we get sucked into the 1% AUMs, the 2% AUMs, the high cost mutual funds with the humongous loads, right? I think it is very, very important to wake up, like you said, and get a hold of your finances. And it really is okay, even if you do it in your 50s, and you're showing us that. And I really appreciate you sharing how you practically cut back some of your costs, and one of them being a big move to downsize your housing. Can you tell us by how much you downsized your housing, square footage-wise? We went from, and it's hard to do, downsizing lifestyle inflation is painful. Yes. It's not easy. You know, you could be driving your BMWs or Mercedes and have car loans, but physicians should buy cars in cash. Everybody should buy cars in cash if they can. And we leased a car, we had car loans, and we have four cars free and clear in cash, two for our kids. And we put that money towards savings. And then with the house, as you asked, we downsized from about 4,500 square feet to 2,500 square feet. We cut 2,000 square feet of stuff wow. and burden out of our lives. We aren't necessarily minimalistic, but we're value-based spenders now. We have more than enough space for us and when the two kids come home, but it's not more than we need. I think physicians, you know, housing is one of the critical rocks that you've got to get right. For families of four, who needs more than, say, four bedrooms, two and a half or three baths? I mean, who needs all this square footage? You know, the maintenance costs, the carrying costs, the interest costs, the costs just compound against you. Yeah. And actually, that's a good thing when you are a late starter. It's a superpower, really, when you're a late starter, that your kids have grown and you don't necessarily need to have a huge yard and four bedrooms anymore. You could downsize comfortably. And you could consider that a pro for late starters. Yeah, I'd say it's critical. Yeah. I mean, downsize your cars, downsize your house, cut where you can cut, but you can only cut so much before it hurts. You got to try and increase your income, grow the gap, save the gap, invest the gap, and do so wisely. It's really not hard, but it's really simple, but not easy, as we said before. Right. It just takes intentionality. Yeah. And awareness, consciousness conscious spending as opposed to unconscious spending. Absolutely. You know, when we downsized, I felt like it was a somewhat of a social hit. I think the decision or the stress leading up to the downsizing was a whole lot more painful than the actual downsizing. We went from a 3,000 square foot house down to a 1,200 square foot house that we rented. And just going from an attending style of living to a resident style of living felt from the outside, the people that were around us, you know, they were kind of worried about us. Like, are you okay? Like, everything okay at work, you know? <laughs> and I had to reassure them that everything is fine. My career is fine. We're just making this decision to make our financial lives better, you know? But there was a lot of concern from the parents and the in-laws and such, right? Did you face any of that? No, I think there was a lot of joy that we finally woke up and we're taking better care of ourselves. It's like, you can be heavy physically and you can be heavy financially. You're really striving for balance and equilibrium with weight and finances in many aspects of health. Financial health is just one. Interesting. So did you also find yourself making more healthy cuts and changes in your lifestyle as you made more value-based decisions on your spending? Well, now that I've come back on work, I'm working out more. When you buy back time and you have more headspace, you can pursue creative pursuits. You can pursue side hustles. I mean, physicians are excellent side hustlers. You can pursue taking care of your physical health because that's what you'll have going into retirement. You know, that's an asset you can't get back. Yes. Just like time. Yeah, so important that the piece about, you know, working out and eating better, and that really is so much easier when you have the headspace to even think about it and the actual time in the day to get it in. And, you know, the freedom to design your schedule so that you can prioritize those things. It's so important. 
you don't want to miss out on your kids growing up either. And physicians tend to be type A, hyperfunctioners, 60, 80 more hours a week. That's not life. You need time and space in your life to enjoy the present and plan for the future. You know, I never met my future self till later in life. And you got to take care of them in many ways. And if you meet them and you know that you've got to transition out of your job. I mean, when we're physicians, we're genetically intertwined with being a physician. It's part of our genome and our personality. You our know, identity. When, yeah. When people ask who you are, you say, I'm a physician, but you know, I'm Bill and I'm a person and I have a whole life that isn't that life as a physician. And we need to embrace that yes. first. Yes. So, so true. We talked about practical tips. Now you're getting into the mindset piece. So tell us, what are some of the really key mindset shifts that can impact your financial journey, especially for late starters? Well, for late starters, you got to wake up. and You've got to educate yourself. You've got to do it quicker than most. Mm -hmm. You've got to embrace saving. You know, that's a critical step. You've got to embrace intentionality. You've got to embrace the joy of saving, the game of saving, gamify it. I mean, it's fun. If I get a windfall or a tax refund, I'm buying low cost index funds. You know, it's not getting spent. It's fun. It feels good. These things that we buy, the luxury items that we buy feel good for a second. You know, we've learned about hedonic adaptation and it doesn't feel good in the long run. You know, I just saw an article today or a post today about the ultra wealthy billionaires and the cars they drive. It's amazing when you find out that they're driving Hondas and Toyotas and people are like, why is that? Well, it's just like it doesn't mean anything to them. It was fascinating. And the public thinks this is you know, unconscionable. Why are they doing this when they have all the money in the world? Well, it's a value. It's a value. Absolutely. There are times where I still drive a stick shift Civic from 10, 11 years ago now. <laughs> It's looking like an old car now. And every time I think about upgrading, I'm like, maybe I should get a Tesla. <laughs> It'd be good for the environment. <laughs> but I still well, like you know, it, you know the physician and Tesla is almost synonymous with success. <laughs> maybe one of the few physicians that has absolutely no desire to buy a Tesla. Really? I do want an EV, you know, because I think it's just better for the environment. I think that's where we need to go. I'm more of a hybrid guy, but that's one thing I did get right because I've owned three cars in my life. I'm on my third. It may have been, you know, a high cost Toyota 4Runner. It may have been an Audi A4 that I'm currently driving, but I've been driving it for 12 years. It has 170,000 miles on it. I'm driving it beyond 200,000, hopefully, and I'll pay for my next car in cash. At this point, it'll be, you know, something in the Mazda, Toyota, Honda range. And I have no need for something that's more functional than your average car. What I was getting at was every time I think about upgrading to this Tesla, it just I don't want to, right? I don't, I really don't want to because I don't know, I like my car. And the thing is that anytime you upgrade to something nicer and better, like you said, hedonic adaptation, you get used to it. But initially, anytime I get something really nice, it stresses me out. Like I'm so worried about keeping it looking nice. I can't get a dent on it, you know? And a Civic, it's so low stress for me because it's already pretty dented. <laughs> Well, you know, I would recommend all physicians buy used cars. Everybody should buy a used car. Why take the depreciation hit in somebody else? Teslas have to be new. They're higher cost, obviously. You know, it's funny that we're even talking about this, but it's a dream of a lot of physicians. I deserve this, you know. Right. I've worked so hard. I've lived a life of deprivation. I deserve this. Well, you know, if you're a seven-figure physician and you can afford it in cash and afford the upkeep, by all means, go right ahead. But a lot of physicians aren't that. You know, the average physician does not have that income. What are you doing paying a third of your income to buy a Tesla? It can be ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. And that I deserve this mentality, it really can come back to hinder your financial progress. That you can take that I deserve this mentality to all kinds of length, from cars to purses to expensive shoes and such. But really, what you deserve is financial peace of mind. What you deserve is to be able to work when you want to and make the schedule that you want and show up for your patients in the best way possible and not be stressed out about money. Doctors shouldn't have to be living paycheck to paycheck, you know. And I think that gratification 
that we get from buying something new and shiny once you get that dopamine hit. It's almost like an addiction. And this becomes like, I deserve this addiction rather than just once. It tends to happen in all areas of spending. And so, so important to keep in mind that when you are spending that money on this, I deserve this item that is high priced and generally humongous expense, that you are giving away your time and freedom to that thing. And you really need to ask yourself, is my time and is my freedom, my future financial stability worth this? What do I deserve really? Do I deserve this bag or do I deserve that financial peace? Well, you know, they say in YNAB world that every dollar needs a job and it can compound against you or be an opportunity cost that compounds for you and it can grow or you can succumb to the opportunity cost, a term that I never really understood as a young physician. Yes. I mean, you can take the $20,000 trip or imagine what $20,000 would do compounding for you over 10, 20 years. And so the cost of the trip is actually much bigger than you thought. But on the other side, it provides you with what you should do with your money, memories, memory dividends, just like the author Bill Perkins says in the book, Die With Zero, which is a great book. When you're buying memories, experiences, time with family and friends, that's how we value spending money now. It's mm -hmm. not the thing. Right. We've harped on cars. And we had Rob Berger on our show, Catching Up to Fi, and he talked about cars being the time freedom retirement buster. I mean, he went through the math. He talks all about compounding and he really harped on cars. So it's worth harping on cars. Think of the opportunity cost you have buying a $20,000 used car versus a sixty dollars or $80,000 new car. And all the money that goes in between, that gap that compounds for you can be huge. We just don't pay attention to it. Yes, it's a depreciating asset. It's a liability. It is the definition of an expense. You are not going to be earning cash from it monthly unless you're, you know, renting it out. But in any case, if you're using it as your transportation vehicle and don't have a business, you're not going to be earning money from it. It's not going to appreciate in value generally unless you're talking about very specific cars. And we're talking about a multi-thousand dollar expense. So yes, agreed. A Chanel bag still doesn't compare to the splurge of getting a really nice car because both of those are expenses, liabilities that you're trading your time and money for, and you're not going to be really getting any financial gain out of it. So you really, really need to consider the big things like Bill is saying, the little things also help, like I'm saying. But in general, this concept of time value of money, the opportunity cost that you sacrifice or you know trade when you buy something really expensive is really something to think about as you're making those value-based spending decisions. Yeah, Ramit Sethi says it really well, and he wrote the book, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, with regards to the latte factor, don't worry about the $30 expense. Worry about the $30,000 expense. Yeah. Those are the decisions that are really important. I mean, okay, I disagree with that statement because some people spend $30 on a coffee every single day and then it becomes a $1,000 expense when it becomes a habit. The occasional $30 splurge, not a big deal. However, if it becomes a habit that you're getting five, $10 latte at Starbucks every morning and every afternoon for your pick-me-up, well, then this is going to become a large line item in your budget. So it's really about the habits as well when it comes to the small spends. And those help as well when you're really trying to make that compounding progress. So let's get back to late starters. What advice would you have for late starters who may be struggling with the regret and shame associated with their past financial decisions? Well, that's a hard one. It's a very good question. I still struggle with regret and shame. It's a process. It doesn't necessarily go away. Sometimes every day I go to work and I realize that I'm burned out and I can't do it today or I'm working too many days in a row. I have that financial regret and shame where I want more of my time. I want to be able to say, I don't have to go to work today. I don't have to work four 12-hour shifts this week. So it's important to process this. And how you process it is take your head out of the sand, take action, realize that you're not the only one doing this. 
you are not alone. I mean, we created the community catching up to five for those people that felt alone in their finances and their financial struggles and their late starts. And physicians aren't the only ones that have this problem. It's a universal problem. It is kind of the American way to late start. We, as I say, are the silent majority. So you're not alone. Ask for help. It's not a shame to get a financial advisor. Just make sure it's a flat fee or hourly fee or project-based fee that gets you your plan. You need a plan, so get help to get a plan. You don't have to manage your own finances. It's okay to pay somebody else to help you do it because it will help you with the emotional distress of a market drawdown. Mm -hmm. You know, the worst thing you can do, and I'll tell you my biggest mistake. This is important because I don't want physicians to do this. At the time of the Great Recession, we were low-digit, single-digit savers. We had renovated a house to the nines, our forever house, right? We were always going to stay there. And we were quickly upside down because of the Great Recession, had lost our equity in the home, had high mortgage payments. So we were cash poor and we weren't saving. And then the bull market happened. We sold at the bottom because we got scared and were risk adverse. So we had all these things going against us and we missed a good portion of this big bull market we just had because of these decisions and because of fear and scarcity. Get a hold of an abundant mindset. Get a hold of a savings mindset. Get help. Get started. But the path is going to be the same as somebody that retires early versus the ones that are late and retire, say, on time. It's a 10 to 15-year path if you do the right things. We just have less time and are maybe a little more risk-averse and cannot afford big mistakes anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, to face the fact that you've made a mistake, I think, requires a good bit of insight and actual knowledge and learning about finances. I think a lot of us that start learning about finances then realize, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I just realized I had this moment when I had my financial awakening. I was sewing the cover to a couch instead of spending time with my kids. Like the definition of a scarcity mindset, I was on my maternity leave, not spending time with my kids and sewing the cover to a couch because I was too afraid of spending money. And I was prioritizing all the wrong things, right? And then I'm listening to a finance audiobook and realize, oh man, I did it all wrong. And really, like you said, taking action made me feel a whole lot better about it. To sit down and we made a budget, we wrote down what we owed and to whom and for how much, and we made a plan on how to start paying things down and then how to start turning things around. And actually, initially, I guess it turned into, you know, saving even more. But somehow, even though we were saving more and spending less, the scarcity and the shame of it became less. The shame of making the mistakes started to fade as we started to write our ship. And it went from shame and fear, especially when I first wrote my post about our journey. It was a whole lot of shame and fear about how I'd let my family get from making a doctor salary to living paycheck to paycheck. But the turnaround is such a powerful, powerful thing. And not only for you, but for everyone else around you. And all you need to do is just start taking that action and things will get better. And then when you're talking, Bill, I hear so much abundance in what you're saying in the fact that you have decided to just cut back working full time, 100 uh, percent full time, because you want to take care of your health. You want to live a healthier life. That's such an important and vast mindset shift that actually results from taking action. And of course, you can also work at it with a coach or a therapist. But for me, I'm like you. It's the actions that make me feel better. Yeah, I mean, I needed a little financial therapy, right? (laughs) I was in financial dire straits. And, you know, mental health and financial independence are intertwined. We physicians have a four times higher suicide rate, right? Mm -hmm. That's out there. I think financial reasons are out there as well, as well as malpractice and patient care issues. But don't underestimate the power of financial independence to take care of your mental health. You know, your patient's care will be better. Your self-care will be better. It has broad ramifications in our lives to pay attention to our financial health. Okay, Bill. So we talked about practical taking action. Could you share some thoughts on 
creating a financial plan for late starters? What are some of the key components of such a plan? I actually, based on your prep for me, brought up our financial plan. Excellent. We have a written financial plan. I don't know how much detail you want me to go into it, but it's important. And if you follow it, you'll see progress. I mean, losing weight is no different than, you know, cutting expenses and budgeting. I'm calorie counting now because I've got to lose 10 to 20 pounds. <laughs> and I'm already seeing progress, right? And if you make a plan, you'll see progress. So the first thing you got to do is set your goals. See what your present nest egg is, what your liquid assets are, what your present net worth is, and then go through your goals. And for example, I say here, our investments will provide an income of $200,000 a year while growing at the rate of inflation, providing with financial independence on July 1st of 2028. They got to be time-based goals. Our other goal is we'll reach a net worth of $5 million by July 4th, 2026. So specific. Why July 4th? Independence Day? Absolutely. I, I it, love it. It had to be fun. And it will pay up our mortgage and all debt by this certain date. And then we have savings goals. We'll save 35% to 50% of our after-tax overhead income every year. And we use gross income now, actually. We'll max out our 401ks, backdoor Ross, HSA annually and invest any additional savings in a taxable brokerage. And then we also dabble in multifamily syndications as a concentrated bet. Next, you've got to have your defense. You've got to have your insurance plan. You know, we'll maintain property insurance for our home. We'll maintain full coverage for our vehicles. The total of our homeowner's auto liability plus umbrella policy limits, which is really important, will be at least $3 million. And I'll have malpractice coverage. We'll have long-term disability coverage. We'll carry life insurance till our human capital is transitioned to financial capital. And we don't need life insurance or disability insurance anymore, which is coming soon. And then we'll maintain an emergency fund of nine to 12 months in our case. Then we have a housing plan, you know, and we paid off our house, so we don't have that issue. Our plan is to live here 10 years minimum and then potentially retire here. You then have a spending plan. We'll track our spending with YNAB and one of many budgeting apps. And we'll have quarterly meetings with our spouse to make sure there's buy-in and understanding. We won't use credit to purchase automobiles. We'll only use credit for convenience and we'll credit card hack so we can go on free flights. Business class, right? That's you can right. do And then we come up with our investment policies and we go through all of what we plan to do with our investments. One of the key factors here, what we didn't do before, is number seven. We will not panic and sell securities due to market correction. Yes. By goal, we go through our retirement plan and we go through our asset. Now, here comes the one everybody wants to focus on, asset allocation. What am I investing in? How fast is it going to grow? How much Bitcoin do I need? I mean, I don't invest in Bitcoin. It's a speculation, not an investment to me. It has no cash flow. But, you know, we're in a small smattering of KISS value-based index funds. And yes, we invest in international. Yes, we have a dabble in REITs, a dabble in small cap value, but it's fundamentally simple and low cost. And we talk about college. Our kids will graduate from college debt-free. And they have. We're very proud of that. Woohoo! Congratulations. And then people forget about their estate plan. And that's part of our financial plan. And lastly, we have asset protection. Financial plan isn't what you invest in, your asset allocation. That's like 20%. You know, you got to pay attention to the other 80%. Yes, absolutely. Everybody wants to talk about, you know, the minutia of the differences between one index fund and another. And those kind of posts and podcasts get a lot of hits for some reason. But really, there's so much more to getting a financial plan in place as you've laid out. And I love how detailed you were, about, even about, you know, just maintaining insurance coverage. Incredibly important. And the fact that you've committed to it and written it down makes it even more likely that it's actually going to happen, right? And especially writing down these goals is a very, very powerful thing and giving them a date you know, that I will be financially independent by this date and then monitoring your progress towards that date. Even if you decide to change, sometimes life changes, our goals change. We realize, hey, maybe I don't even actually want to retire early. I just want to be financially independent earlier, or I just want to have that freedom to do what I want. You know, whatever it is, if plans change and you decide during a quarterly meeting that you need to modify your written financial plan. You certainly can. But just the process of writing it down makes it that much more possible. And we don't change it unless we've sat on it for three months. 
Yes. There's no change that happens the next day. Yes. It's something like we're thinking about a change. Okay, we talk about a change. We don't try and time a change. Right. You want to be very intentional with it because it's a long-term wayfinding change. You know, it's like Lewis and Clark. You know, they didn't know how to get to the West Coast and they took everything they thought they needed and they found their way with wayfinding. They did alter their course. They did meet hardships. They overcame the hardships. We're very resilient. We late starters are very resilient. Love that. So speaking of couples going on a journey together, how did you and your wife come to be on the same page with this journey? And what was that process like? Well, I'm the CFO of our family. She's the big picture gal, and I'm more the smaller picture logistics guy. So we're well matched. Unfortunately, we're natural spenders, both of us. We didn't have that great counterpart of a more frugal person in either of us that would have balanced the financial lack of planning side. But it wasn't that hard because she recognized the same problem when I woke up. She didn't stop me from spending. I didn't stop her from spending until we made a full stop and said, okay, what are we doing? We don't need to focus on the kids anymore. We need to focus on ourselves. And the key is to learn to focus on yourselves before you end up in the funnel of medical school, in the funnel of residency, in the funnel of raising kids that goes on for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's easy for that time to just pass you by. And if you don't know how to partition your first paycheck into spending, savings, investing, you're going to get the rest of it wrong. It starts from the small things and it compounds. So getting her on board wasn't that hard. I know it can be hard for others because there will be spouses that say, oh, I married a doctor. I want to live the rich doctor life because I deserve it. That's why high-income professionals, not just doctors, we pick on them because we are them and this podcast is the frugal physician. <laughs> but this applies to all income professionals. No, we don't deserve this. We deserve to live a balanced life. We deserve to live a balanced marriage. And healthy financial approach to marriage is only good for your marriage. What causes a bunch of divorce? Poor financial decisions. Our marriage is thriving, not just because of finances, but because we love empty nests. We love each other. And things have only gotten better over time. And the fact that we're handling our finances prospectively as opposed to retrospectively only enhances that. That's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear it. And I 100% agree. Getting on the same financial page is so important for a marriage, whether it includes joint accounts or separate accounts. Either way, there needs to be full transparency. When two people are on board and going in the same direction financially, can be a really powerful marriage fixer. Bill, this has been super fun. Thank you. I really appreciate your perspective. I really appreciate how well you are able to communicate these concepts. And it's obvious that you have been doing a lot of thinking and teaching about this yourself. And I really, really enjoy your podcast. So please tell my listeners where they can find your podcast. Yeah, Becky Heptig and I host a show that we've done for almost a year now called Catching Up to Fi. We've really hit a chord. We're the only, I think, podcast in this space. We're almost the only platform in this space, which is astounding because of the audience we want to reach. The audience is massive and we're growing. We've seen almost a quarter of a million downloads. We have a Facebook community of 6,000. People are finding us. They're not alone. We're helping each other catch up to Fi. You can reach us at World Wide Web catchingupdefy.com. All your resources are there. We encourage you to reach out. We encourage you to join our Facebook community. We push out a podcast every week. You'll see it on all the social media channels. You can even watch it on YouTube. We're trying to be everywhere and anywhere so that our audience can find us and we can help each other catch up to Fi. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate your time and we hope to have you back soon. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your inspiring journey and valuable insights into late starter financial independence. It's clear that it's never too late to start working towards financial freedom. To all our listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Finding Financial Freedom with the Frugal Physician. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, leave a review, and share with your family and friends. Remember, it's never too late to take control of your financial future. Until next time. Stay frugal, y'all.
Now, a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on your journey to safeguarding your future. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisors, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.